All right, it's going to be a long day of travel. It's about 5.30 in the morning, and I'm normally up around five, and I'm usually doing something, but today I'm driving to the airport in Ontario, and I'm gonna jump on a plane, waiting to get coffee until I get through security. So I'm headed to the airport, gonna find some parking. Excited for the day. I just landed in South Carolina and I am gonna head to the hotel. I'm at the airport waiting for my Lyft driver to show up. And what I'm doing is representing HMC at the Large Firm Roundtable, which is an AIA event, and uh, it's going to be all about technology. I'm really excited about the speakers. We'll get into those later on in the video, um, but it's gonna be a really cool time and I'm looking forward to it. So I'm here representing HMC's design technology for the AIA's LFRT, which is the Large Firm Roundtable. And basically it's, uh, it's when a bunch of different firms who are larger in nature across the U.S. get together and talk about different issues that are going on in their different sectors. It's a really refreshing conversation, a roundtable conversation with all the different large firms. You know, we've got SOM, HOK, ZGF, NBBJ, those types of firms. They're all represented here by their IT managers or the CIO or their design technology managers, their digital practice directors. And, and what we're doing is talking about the issues that we're all facing because you know the, the things that happen in our firm are not just happening there. They're happening all across these different firms. And, and how have they struggled? How have they succeeded? what are things to look out for, and these are all great conversations to have in this roundtable setting. There's also vendors that come in and they present basically you know, ways that they're trying to solve these problems and different firms can then chime in after that person uh, presents or during the presentation 
and discuss the, the issues and the things that they're seeing that need to be taken on still or the things that are succeeding or the things that are not. So overall, a great discussion over two days with lots and lots of different people, lots of different perspectives from lots of different territories within the U.S. and they're all working in different markets. But because we're all of a similar size, um, there's a lot of things that are the same that happen across all these different firms. So it's a good conversation around those types of issues. Just to kind of continue on that train of thought regarding meeting with all these different firms, I wanted to talk about what we were talking about as a group as to what the biggest challenges facing us are. So the first one is organizational standardization and platform adoption. Uh, I guess a lot of different people are struggling with this, HMC included, and we're talking about the tools that we use, I think is, is the biggest thing, and getting people to not only just adopt the tools, but go deeper into those tools as well. The second thing was a big issue was that the costs keep going up. I mean, software is crazy expensive and we're almost beholden to the software developers. There was actually quite a bit of talk about what to do about that and how to deal with it. Um, what are the different options that firms have when it comes to rising software costs? The next one was shedding unadopted technology. So technology that's fallen by the wayside or moving on to the next thing because the, the old way doesn't work very well anymore. Or there's new things involved in the new releases of software that could really benefit us, but we're still using the older versions. So that's a big deal. I mean, there's uh, definitely something that I've noticed at HMC over the years is that um, you know, people get comfortable with something and they don't want to change, uh, yet there's so many new technologies and things that are more efficient, more effective, and newer ones, and we're very slow to get rid of those. The last one was collaboration. You've obviously heard this word a lot around HMC, you've heard it uh, in the industry, and so all these other firms are dealing with it as well. And I think that one of the things that I really latched onto was that the technology is there, the ability to collaborate is there, but the culture is not. And this is definitely something that we're approaching with our team pods, for sure, and it's working out to be very successful. Um, but at the same time, when we're talking about working cross office and we're talking about um, having you know, remote workers on teams and being able to trust those people, that's where the culture really comes in and really matters, and that's something we have to work really hard on and be intentional about. So while the technology is there, while we've put intranet in place and while we've put all these different uh, great pieces of software in place so that we can chat and communicate and do all these things in real time, uh, we still need a culture of collaboration and that I think is something that is much harder to develop and instill into our normal workday. You know one thing I hear time and time again is that no one has time to learn, no one has time to change, um, and unfortunately, that's why we're in a lot of the positions that we're in. And so we have to get really comfortable with a constant state of change. We have to get really comfortable with adopting new tools and new ways of working in a world that's changing faster than ever. All right, that's enough of that for now. Let's go inside the submarine. It's gonna be awesome, I can't wait. That was amazing. 
I, I love that kind of stuff. It's like, it's steampunk now, but it was real then. I just can't even imagine living in a space like that. I mean, how long were they out at sea in that little tube underwater? I mean, I'm sure they came up, you know, every 24 hours or so, or I don't know. But can you imagine living down there day to day? It would be, it would be tough. It would be really tough. All right, I'm gonna go check out the aircraft carrier now and uh, can't wait, it's the USS Yorktown. All right, I am on the hangar deck of the USS Yorktown. This place, fascinating. They had up to 100 planes in this flight deck, not the flight deck, below the flight deck, while still operating the flight deck up above. So that's absolutely incredible to me. Uh, all of these giant steel beams. I can't even imagine how much the ship weighs and displaces in the ocean and for how long it would be a city on the water. Absolutely incredible. All right, so I wanted to talk about a couple of the speakers at LFRT and the first one that we listened to was Dave Gilmore from Design Intelligence. And Dave always has a lot of great things to say. I love to listen to him and I think that uh, you know design intelligence is doing an amazing job telling us and keeping us abreast of all the things that are going on in the world that apply to the profession of architecture so uh, I think what's most interesting about what he was talking about and I'll just kind of sum it up really quickly because there's so many topics that he covers uh, but the first one was that we have to create a place with magnetism we have to create an environment where we work, our office, has to be a place that is a magnetic buzz to other people. And so I want to ask you, uh, because this is a leadership question, what are we doing to create a place where exciting things are happening in the world of architecture? What are we going to do in our office, in our work environment, to let people know that we're great to work with? What do you see the first thing you walk through the doors of your office? Do you see a place where architecture happens? Or is it just some nondescript building? How do you know when you walk in the doors of our offices that you're walking into an architect's office? How do you know when you walk through the studios where you work that architecture is done there, that a creative endeavor is happening? I really feel like we need to focus on making the work environments for our staff and for our clients when they come visit to see that they are in a very creative place. All right, and the last thing that I'll touch on that Dave brought up that I thought was really interesting was the importance of doing research at your firm. And we need to develop deep levels of expertise so that we can truly help solve our clients' problems. I think that this is one of those things that takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time and investment, but it is truly something that will set us apart. All right, I'm not lost, but I can't imagine how people remembered where to go. Check it out, little dentist office here. Tight quarters, here we are in the kitchen. The galley looks amazing. <laughs> Just so many little compartments. Pretty sure that they didn't have air conditioning back on this ship when they were out at sea. Here's a look at just some of the planes that they have on display here in the hangar deck. I love how these planes wings fold and I get why they did it. I mean they had to cram up to a hundred planes into this hangar at any one time. They had planes hanging from the ceiling at the same time they had planes down here. It must have been like an amazing Rubik's Cube moving these things around while still holding flight operations up on the flight deck. But how did the wings not rip off the planes? I mean, it's, it's like a hinge. That's it. Absolutely crazy. Check it out right there. That's the bridge that I ran across this morning. Isn't it beautiful? I, I love bridges, man. Bridges are <laughs> so cool. All right, check this out. This is a little hooky deal right here, the lifeline that lets these planes land on this flight deck and not fall off the other end or, or have to take off again. 
We're under the tail section of an F-4 Phantom. Fantastic aircraft. The next speaker at LFRT was Phil Bernstein. He's a fellow of the AIA. He's an Autodesk fellow as well. He teaches at Yale University. He's strictly an academic now. He doesn't work at Autodesk anymore. And I thought he had a lot of really interesting things to say because now he's really interested in what the next generation of architects need to be trained as to fit into the profession of architecture when they get here, which is, you know, 10 years away. So if we're looking at 2028, what does the profession of architecture have to be like to accept them, their skills, what do they need to be ready for? Because obviously it's kind of two things going on at the same time, education and practice. You can see all the way through this, <laughs> no motor, but uh, pretty cool. standing in front of, to me, what is probably the most important aircraft of my childhood. First it started with Robotech and then brought to the world with Top Gun. And uh, I'm talking about the F-14A Tomcat right here and the best folding wing aircraft ever built in my opinion. I just love this aircraft. I know it wasn't the fastest aircraft, it wasn't the most maneuverable aircraft, but because the wings folded and sometimes turned into a robot, it was the best aircraft ever made. I'm so excited that I just got to see it on the flight deck of the USS Yorktown. I am on the bridge of the USS Yorktown. Here's the captain's chair right there. Super cool. Uh, you can see everything from up here. Check it out. And uh, just such a neat, neat place. Definitely worth your time if you ever have the chance to come up here. All right, so there were two things that I really wanted to talk about from Phil Bernstein's talk. The first one was, he, he basically gave a, a quick history. You know, we've gone from hand drawing to CAD to BIM to what we're calling now connected BIM, where basically you have this model that lives in the cloud and all the other models are linked to it and there's all the information infused into the elements of that model. and the way that we can derive data from that or pump data into it, this is connected BIM, all right? That, at least that's what we're coining the term right now. So what does that mean? What new things are we going to be able to do with these new technologies? So, uh, you know, a lot of this was more questions than answers, but I think it's very provoking type of questions that we're thinking about. What's next? What is this going to allow us to do that we've never been able to do before and how is the profession going to change? And then thinking back to the first part about students and how we're gonna be training the next generation of architects to come in, how do we have to change how we train them now for a future that's 10 years out? All right, so that leads me to part two, which is the new value proposition of architecture. And when we're talking about these new ideas with connected BIM and with what's the future of training for architecture and where we're going to be, what are the new value propositions? And I think one of the things that really hit home to me was how architects have distanced themselves from the reason why our clients build buildings in the first place. So something that's for sure is that our clients are not building buildings to employ us. They're not doing it to employ contractors. And uh, so I think one of the things that we really have to come to grips with and spend some time doing is coming up with ways that we can link our goals to their goals. So part of our value proposition needs to be rooted into how do we help them achieve their goals? How can we link technology? How can we link architecture? How can we link space? How can we link flow? How can we link all of these things that we think about when we design a building into delivering and helping our clients reach their goals faster than ever. So if we wanted to change from commodity-based, you know, just producing drawings so that the client can go do what they really want to do, we want to change to become outcome-based. And so I have some ideas on how to do that, 
but more importantly, I wanna know how you think we could do that. So enter that into the comments below in this video. This was an amazing tour of the Naval Shipyard here in Charleston, South Carolina, and I hope that if you get the chance to do it, you will too. That submarine that I visited is going to be turned into a reef off the coast of South Florida in the not too distant future, so I'm glad I got to see it while I did. But I have one parting thought for you, and so I want you to tell me what you think the future of architecture is and how I can help get you there. It's really my job to focus on the people. Yeah, we've got the tools, we can get the tools, we can make the tools, but what about the people? The people are the most important part. They're the ones who are actually figuring out what to do with this stuff. So I wanna know what you think the future of architecture is. I wanna know how technology fits into that, of course, but I wanna know how I can help you get there. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.